the mystery of the holy sacrifice of the Mass, the real presence of Jesus in the Holy Eucharist. This is what it's all about. Jesus paid a debt he didn't know because we owed a debt we couldn't pay. And in recounting how it was that their hearts had been burning within them as he opened the scriptures, they then conclude that our eyes were open in the breaking of the bread. That once our eyes are open, the eyes of faith to the real presence of Jesus in the holy sacrifice of the mass, in the breaking of the Eucharistic bread, then we shouldn't need his physical presence because faith really matures when we grasp the real presence of Jesus in the breaking of the bread. Thank you very much. And good morning. It's wonderful to be with you. For me, it's a special treat to be back in my hometown of Pittsburgh where I grew up. And I'm always reminded of an experience that I had several years ago. Sometimes you have an experience that you don't appreciate until later on when you reflect on it, then you realize it's practically life-defining. Well, that's what happened to me one day when I got a call from a friend of mine that a mutual friend was in Mercy Hospital with only a day or two left. And so I dropped everything and just rushed to Pittsburgh from Steubenville, Ohio, to see Father Ronald Lawler, a wonderful Capuchin priest and a dear friend. I knew he was in Mercy Hospital and I knew Mercy was downtown, but I grew up Protestant, so I knew right where Presbyterian Hospital was, <laughs> but not where the Daughters of Mercy had tucked away their fine institution. And so when I got downtown, I got real close and I knew that, but I couldn't find it. So after driving around the block two or three times, I finally did something that many men seem to have trouble doing. I pulled over, rolled down the window, and I asked for directions. Well, I clearly asked the wrong fellow because he started chuckling. And I'm like, what's so funny? He said, you're practically there. I said, I realize that, but I can't just find it. He said, well, look, just turn down pride and you'll find mercy. And he walked away. And I'm thinking that's the last time I asked for directions until I looked straight ahead and the street sign read Pride Avenue. And so when I turned down Pride, I found Mercy Hospital staring me in the face. I couldn't wait to tell Father Ronald. He chuckled too. He said, that's the story of my life. I had to agree it's become the story of my life too, turning down Pride in order to find mercy. It's also a reminder to me of my favorite story in sacred scripture. If you have a Bible, turn with me to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24. If you didn't bring a Bible, just look on with the Protestant friends you invited to come along with you. <laughs> but I think we all know this story pretty well, so it doesn't matter if you have a Bible to follow along with or not, because it's the story of Clopas and his companion who are walking on the road that leads from Jerusalem to Emmaus. It's about 10 miles long. It would have been a, quite a journey. At the beginning of the journey, as you recall, an apparent stranger meets up with them, or at least they mistook him for a stranger because the reader knows it's the resurrected Lord, but Clopas and his companion, for whatever reason, they don't recognize him. And so he asks them what they're talking about. And they turn to him and say, are you the only visitor in Jerusalem who doesn't know the things that have happened in these days? What things, he asks, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death, crucifying him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since this happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning. They didn't find his body. They came back saying that they had seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. And they go on and on and on, and he just let them. I mean, at any point, he could have said, time out, take a closer look, it's me, but he doesn't. And you gotta wonder why. You know, and then when they're finally finished, you'd kind of expect him to say, you know, buck up, it's not as bad as you think, you know, and offer them some words of hope, comfort, consolation. But instead, when they're done, he turns them, and it almost sounds like he turns on them. He says to them in verse 25, O foolish men and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken, was it not necessary 
that the Christ should suffer these things and then enter into his glory. And beginning with Moses and all of the prophets, he interpreted them in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. Mile after mile, for hours and hours, the single greatest Bible study in all of history, and there was no recording equipment. (laughs) What a shame. But we know what happens next because they arrived at the village of Emmaus. He looked to be going on, and so they persuaded him to stay with them, at least for a meal, and then they gather at a table. And that's where something happens. And actually, four things happen because we read what he does at the table. He takes, he blesses, he breaks, and he gives them this bread. We also recall exactly what happened. Suddenly, their eyes are open, and just as suddenly, he disappears. And they finally turn to each other and admit, did not our heart burn within us as we walked with him, as he opened up the scriptures? And so they got up from the table and they walked all the way back to Jerusalem. They found the disciples and they reported their experience. And in recounting how it was that their hearts had been burning within them as he opened the scriptures, they then conclude that our eyes were open in the breaking of the bread. Now, we might think it was a flashback. He takes, blesses, breaks, and gives. It's the same sequence of verbs in Luke 24 that you find two chapters earlier in Luke 22 in the upper room on Holy Thursday when he institutes the Eucharist. But they weren't numbered among the 12. So this wasn't a deja vu or a flashback. This was a eureka moment, a supernatural grace when suddenly through the breaking of the bread, their eyes are opened. And we all know, I think, that the phrase, the breaking of the bread, goes on to become something of an idiomatic expression in the first century for what we Catholics describe in the 21st century as the holy sacrifice of the mass, the divine liturgy, whatever phrase we employ in Acts 2.42, and again in Acts 20, verses 6 and 7, and in 1 Corinthians as well. Again and again we hear the breaking of the bread referring to what? the Holy Eucharist. And so as we think about this long journey with an apparent stranger who's opening up the scriptures, causing them, you might call it spiritual heartburn, if you will, but never once illuminating his own identity until that moment when they see him in the breaking of the bread and just as suddenly he disappears. What I wanna explain is going to lead us to the conclusion that once our eyes are open, the eyes of faith, to the real presence of Jesus in the holy sacrifice of the mass, in the breaking of the Eucharistic bread, then we shouldn't need his physical presence. We shouldn't need the visible sign of his own resurrected body. If anything, our Lord knew that if he had remained, it might have become an impediment to faith maturing because faith really matures when we grasp the real presence of Jesus in the breaking of the bread. But whenever I read the story, I'm always reminded of my own life experience and how it goes all the way back to high school here in town when I had a grace of a young adult conversion. I was on a retreat after being in trouble with the law and I won't go into the details of my juvenile delinquency (laughs) for the memory of my mother, (laughs) but suffice to say that I found the Lord that weekend or he found me. And it was a really simple message of the gospel. Jesus paid a debt he didn't know because we owed a debt we couldn't pay. And boy, at that point in my life, I owed a lot of people a lot of debts. To think that Jesus did that for me, made it easy for me to make a decision by the end of that retreat. If the Son of God gave his life for me, then this sinner ought to return the favor, and so I gave my life to him. Well, within a matter of weeks, all of my buddies figured out something happened. I was no longer being invited to parties. I had to find new friends, and in fact, by God's grace, they found me. I got invited not to a party on the weekend, but to a Bible study in the middle of the week, and so I went to my first Bible study. I think everybody could hear the spine cracking as I opened up the Bible for the first time. And so I was wondering what we would be studying, and so the teacher announced to this small group in the living room, we're going to begin in the book of Revelation. And I'm thinking, that's the back of the book. I knew at least that much. And so that night I sat back and listened to some really scary stuff, all about the second coming, all about the Antichrist, all about Armageddon and this horrible battle and the rapture where 
if you were fortunate enough to be faithful, you would be taken to the clouds before the great and terrible tribulation would come. And after an hour, I'm like, wow, okay. <laughs> and so the next week I was back and for several more weeks, we were going through the book of Revelation, hearing all about the Antichrist, the second coming, the rapture and so on. And by the end of the school year, summer came, but not our Lord. In fact, that summer I actually got to be a starting pitcher. So I kind of put the second coming out of mind until the fall semester when I was invited by the same group to another Bible study with a different teacher. And so we went and once again, he was beginning in the back of the Bible with the book of Revelation. And we were hearing all of the same scary stuff again. And after two or three weeks, you know, I said, you know what? I'm gonna just read this for myself beginning in the beginning the book of Genesis. And so for the rest of my high school years, I just began a systematic reading program of going through the scriptures, the old and the new. I was on my third round trip through the Bible when I was getting ready to graduate. And so for me going off to college was, it was an easy thing for me to decide to study theology. And I added philosophy and then a third major economics since my dad was paying tuition and he didn't want an unemployed philosopher as a son. But I remember having a dream come true. A, a prayer was answered because I got to study Greek. And after going into an accelerated program, I began to read the New Testament in the original Greek. And that was exciting. And so for the final semester, we had a project. We didn't know what it was. So we went into the accelerated program final semester. And I was thinking, okay, we're gonna have a major translation project. And so I went there the first day of class thinking three or four of my classmates would be there, I was the only one. They'd all bailed. And so the teacher says, we're gonna translate the book of Revelation. And I'm thinking, 22 chapters? And I'm thinking, maybe I should bail too. And so she said, you know, uh, it was supposed to be a bigger class. And I said, perhaps we could take a smaller book, like Philippians, you know, <laughs> five chapters. She said, no, we're gonna tackle the apocalypse. And so systematically, we began working through the book of Revelation, or rather I did. It's some of the hardest Greek you will find in antiquity. It took me an entire semester to get through 22 chapters, but by the time I was done, I was startled to find out that the word rapture doesn't occur a single time, nor does the term antichrist, nor does the phrase second coming. In fact, the battle of Armageddon is mentioned, but only once near the end. So by the time I was wrapping up my study of the apocalypse, I was wondering why we were wasting all of that time back in high school, worrying about all kinds of things that aren't even mentioned in the book. I'll be honest, I didn't know what the book was about, but finally I figured out what it wasn't about. And it didn't worry me too much because I was in love and we were engaged and after graduation, we got married. And in marrying Kimberly, I married the most beautiful gal on campus and she turned out to be a much better bride than I thought. We went off to seminary as soon as we got back from the honeymoon where I had another prayer answered. Another dream came true because in the three years of my graduate studies in seminary, I finally got to study Hebrew, which had not been offered at the collegiate level. And in studying Hebrew under a brilliant professor who made this old language come alive, I began to be able to read the Old Testament in the original languages as well. Well, just to kind of make a long story short, as I was wrapping up my third and final year, my final semester, I was excited by the process of being interviewed at a Presbyterian church in Northern Virginia. They wanted me to come down to be their pastor. And so I went down and I gave them a kind of job talk, a, a trial a sermon, and they liked it. And so they made me the offer and I thought about it and then I realized in my conversations with all of these parishioners that they were highly educated and not just in other fields, but in scripture. They knew my favorite preachers and teachers. I couldn't just recycle material. And so in agreeing to the job, I realized I'd have to go back and spend these last two or three months of my final semester burrowing in the stacks of the library to find material to preach from because they made it clear that the sermon each Sunday should not be over in less than a half hour, preferably 40 or 45 minutes. I can't imagine what would happen to my pastor if he tried that on Sunday. He would be run out of town. 
But for us, we only celebrated the Eucharist as what we called the Lord's Supper four times a year. So it was a very sermon-centered service and a very pastor-centered church. And I had to really, I had to prepare. And so in those last two or three months of my final semester, getting ready to graduate the top of my class with straight A's, I went back into the library stacks to find new material, but instead I found old material, very old. The ancient fathers of the early church. I found a, a, a series of volumes entitled The Sunday Sermons of the Early Church Fathers. And as soon as I began reading, I knew I'd struck gold. I was reading Ambrose and Augustine and St. John Chrysostom. We had heard about all of these people. I knew the names, but we'd actually never read these primary sources. And I was already involved in a kind of research into the Passover and into Christ's death, which had exposed me to the connection between the Old and the New Testaments. But I mean, these early church fathers made the Bible come alive in a way that I'd never heard before. And at first I wasn't sure what's so different about their sermons than my favorite preacher and the homilies that he would deliver. And then I realized, as St. Augustine put it, they would always show how the New Testament is concealed in the Old and the Old is revealed and fulfilled in the New. And so they would never just take their favorite passages from the New Testament and preach on those. They would always draw from both the Old and the New. And what they were doing for me was something quite unexpected because they were taking familiar stories from the Gospels that I thought I knew like the back of my hand from all of the graduate courses that I'd taken on the Gospels. But St. Ambrose especially, along with Augustine, were just experts at making these familiar stories take on new life. For example, we all know that God sent a Savior to save his people, and his name was Jesus. And as soon as the Savior is born, the Savior needed to be saved because of the imperial decree of this tyrant named Herod, who targeted not only baby Jesus, but all of the Hebrew male children there in Bethlehem. But what Ambrose opened my eyes to is that it had happened before. Long ago, in the Old Testament, God had sent a Savior to save his people, and his name was Moses. And as soon as Moses was born, baby Moses was targeted by the imperial decree of a tyrant named Pharaoh. And not only Moses, but all of the Hebrew male children as well. So what did God do? Well, in the New Testament, we know what he did. He worked through a man named Joseph, who's described as upright and has dreams. And so he could take the Holy Family to safety. Where? To Egypt of all places. You go back to the Old Testament and St. Augustine shows that there was a man named Joseph, who's also the son of Jacob, who's described as upright who has dreams, and so he delivered the holy family of Israel to Egypt for safety of all places. And I knew both stories. I had never seen the convergences or the parallels. But at the right time, of course, God sent the holy family to Egypt. But when Herod dies, the holy family came out of Egypt. Jesus passes through the water, and he's led by the Spirit out into the desert where he proceeded to fast for 40 days and nights. Of course, we all know that. But what I had never noticed before was that when Moses is empowered by the Spirit to lead Israel out of Egypt, they pass through the water as well, and they're led by the Spirit out to the desert where Moses fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, at the end of which time he receives the law of the covenant, and he gives it to Israel there at Mount Sinai. Well, after 40 days of fasting, Jesus is tested. He's undergoing the temptations. And all three times he passed the test, and I knew why, because all three times he quoted the Bible, but Ambrose points out is that all three times he passes the test, he's quoting the book of Deuteronomy, chapter six through eight, which just so happens to be precisely where Moses had corrected these foolish Israelites for failing their exams because of their disobedience. They'd fail these tests because man doesn't live by bread alone, not even the miraculous manna that God provided. You live by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. You shall not put the Lord your God to the test, especially if he is in the process of testing you, and you shall worship the Lord and him alone, not that golden calf you made while I was on top of Sinai. Jesus seemed to know exactly where to go and what to quote, and I had never noticed but the early church fathers were tracking Jesus' actions and words better than my favorite profs. They were experts in the old, they were specialists in the new, but the early church fathers were preaching Sunday after Sunday in ways that built bridges between the old and the new. And I had a notebook and I was keeping track. I had filled eight or 10 pages of notes 
still a month or two before my graduation, before my ordination, before I began preaching every Sunday. And I'm thinking to myself, there's gold in them, the hills. I'm gonna keep digging. I'm gonna keep drawing out more of these treasures. And sure enough, they would take more of the familiar stories. And so Jesus has come out of Egypt. He is now through the water, he's fasted, and he is described as a new Moses. But what did Moses do after the 40 days of fasting? He gave them the law of the covenant there at Mount Sinai. What's the very next thing Jesus does? He gave his followers the sermon on the mount. There's a new mountain because there's a new Moses. There's a new law because there's a new covenant. But as he begins the sermon, he says, I haven't come to abolish the law and the prophets, but rather to fulfill. And so this pattern of the old and the new, promises in the old that are fulfilled in the new, this is what was making my heart burn within me. And so what does Moses do after he gave to Israel the law? He realized the law wasn't enough, and so he chose from the 12 tribes, 12 princes to assist him in governing the people of God. What does Jesus do as soon as the Sermon on the Mount is done? He chose from the many followers, 12 disciples. What a coincidence, not hardly. I mean, he says, you'll sit on 12 thrones and judge the 12 tribes of Israel. This was no accident or a coincidence. And as you continue reading, Moses realizes that even with the help of 12 princes, this unruly crowd is too much. And so on another occasion, he chose 70 elders, anointed them with his spirit to assist him and the 12 princes in leading the people of God, like our Lord, who looked out one day and said, the harvest is plentiful, but the labors are too few. So what did he do that day? From the many followers, he appointed 70 more, or 72, and then anointed them with his spirit just like Moses had done. You know, it reminds me of what Mark Twain once famously said, history does not repeat itself, but it sure does rhyme. It was like divine poetry. When you read how the new is concealed in the old and the old is revealed and fulfilled in the new, you realize there is an artistry, there's a beauty, a subtlety, a kind of poetry when it comes to how much God loves us. And so as you continue reading the early church fathers, as I was doing, their ordinary Sunday sermons were filled with all of these nuggets. And so I graduated. We packed up a U-Haul. We moved to Northern Virginia. I unpacked on Saturday night. I mounted the pulpit on Sunday morning. And for about 40 minutes or so, I shared all of these connections, all of the parallels, all of the convergences between the old and the new, between Jesus and Moses. And after the service was done, I was shaking the hands of all of my parishioners in the back. They were like, wow, we've never heard this before. They thought it was new. I didn't tell them it was ancient. Behind the pulpit, there were a lot of quotation marks, but I wasn't yet ready to tell them my sources because I was still trying to keep ahead of the game. And so week after week, I am drawing more and more out of these early patristic sermons. And so with the help of the 12 and the 70, Moses still grew weary. So on one occasion, he went up the mountain to spend a day alone with God in prayer. He chose from the 12, the three who he was closest to, Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, not only accompanied Moses, but when he returns, they see that his face is glowing with divine glory. They asked him to put on a veil because it was so hard to look upon his face. Well, what does that remind us of? The Mount of Transfiguration where Jesus spends an entire day in prayer, but from the 12, he chose the three who were closest, Peter, James, and John, who accompany him up the mountain and witness the spectacular transfiguration where his face is glowing brighter than the sun when suddenly who should appear? Moses and Elijah. As Ambrose pointed out in one of his sermons, you hear this conversation between Jesus and the law and the prophets. Moses gave the law, Elijah was the greatest of the prophets, and they also happened to be the only two men to have ever fasted for 40 days and nights and survived to tell about it. And so what were they talking about there on top of the mountain? Well, we read in chapter nine of Luke that the topic of conversation was Jesus' departure, which was soon to take place. And so from the fathers, I discovered what I should have known, but didn't, that the Greek word for departure is exodus. And so here is Jesus talking to Moses, I mean, Mr. Exodus himself, but not the old, but the new Exodus. And so this must have gotten Moses wondering, you know, the Exodus didn't just happen out of thin air. We prepared for it through a series of signs, like, you know, turning water into blood in Exodus 7. 
And not just the, the water of the Nile, but even the water in the stone jars, Jesus could have checked that off his list because what was his first sign? Turning water into wine, the water in the stone jars, the same phrase that you find in Exodus 7. If Moses said, well, I turned it into blood, I think our Lord would have said, keep your eyes on that wine, I'm not through with it. By the time it's done, it will be the blood of the new covenant, the new Passover. But Moses could have also pointed out that it healed miraculously, like the leper. Jesus could have checked that off his list as well. Well, I provided you know, the manna in the wilderness to feed the, the 12 tribes of Israel. Our Lord could have pointed out how he had taken five loaves and two fish and fed the 5,000 and filled 12 baskets, symbolizing the 12 tribes of Israel. On and on, the list kept growing, more and more parallels. Sunday after Sunday, I kept sharing all of these things. And like me, they knew both sets of stories, they just never saw the connections. And the more I was helping them make connections between the old and the new, the more both the old and the new were coming alive for them, but also for me. So I'm still trying to stay ahead of the game. And so this is where my study of Jesus as the new Moses, bringing a new law, the new covenant, you know, the Passover was looming larger and larger. And so I began to realize that this is really where it all comes to a head. The culminating point of how the old is fulfilled by the new, well, the culminating point for Moses at the Exodus was the Passover. And so the new Moses, a new Exodus, will bring about a new Passover. And so I began to discover the Eucharist, what we call the Lord's Supper. And how in the early church, they celebrated it not just once a year like Passover, but every week, not four times a year. And so I began to propose to my church that we ought to celebrate it more frequently as well. So on a trial basis, we began to make each service less sermon-centered and make the Eucharist the culminating point. Now, I began to realize in reading the early church fathers that I didn't have what Augustine described as this special gift of holy orders through apostolic succession. So I began to wonder if I wasn't really playing church, you know, pretending to confect the Eucharist when I didn't really have what you find in the Bible or what you find in the Fathers. So in less than two years, I had tendered my resignation. And that's when I went in search of a church that would fit this job description that I kept finding in the Bible, but only when you read the old and the new in this sense of harmony or typology which is how the catechism describes this pattern of the new concealed in the old and the old revealed in the new, to quote from St. Augustine. After resigning from my pastor, we moved back to the college town where we had first met and fell in love. At this point, Kimberly and I had our firstborn son named Michael. And so while she was tending our baby boy, I was also studying at night. I was working at the college as the assistant to the president, but at night I was doing more and more research. Reading now the early church fathers, but reading now for the first time Catholic writers, names that I should have known, but I never read. I mean, names like Garigou Lagrange, Von Baldazar, de Lubach, Congar. These modern Catholic theologians were able to make the Bible come alive like the early church fathers. I remember reading late at night again and again for weeks. Finally, I came out one night to kind of share my findings with my devout evangelical Protestant wife who loved my preaching, who knew I was stealing from the fathers, but that's where it stopped. And so I came out and I began to read, not from the early church fathers, but from a Catholic writer named Louis Bouillet. And when she heard it, she was amazed. She was like, that sounds like you're preaching. I miss your sermons. It's, it sounds like the fathers. And I say, well, it's, it's Louis Bouillet. He's showing how the Bible is liturgical and the liturgy is biblical. And I'm wondering if we shouldn't be looking into a church that's more liturgical like the Episcopalians. And her eyes got wide as saucers. And she said, Episcopalian, need I remind you, I was born and raised a Presbyterian. My dad's a Presbyterian minister. My uncle is too. My brothers are. You're still a Presbyterian. I'd never seen her burst into tears. She's like, I don't want to be Episcopalian. <laughs> I'm like, okay, fine. We won't be, okay. And so I, won't, I went back into my study and I heard her say, please don't do that again. All right. And so I didn't for about three months. And about three months later, I would remember this because I was reading through the documents of Vatican II for the first time in my life, realizing that I had struck gold again. And so I was working through the Constitution on the Church, Lumen Gentium, and I came out, I'm like, you gotta hear this. 
And I began reading it. And she got excited. She said, that's beautiful. What is that? I said, you guess. I thought we weren't going to do this anymore. Come on, you, get, you got your master's in theology like me, girl. Come on. And she said, I have no idea, but I'm sure you'll tell me. And I said, this is the teaching of the Catholic Church in the Second Vatican Council. I said, I'm wondering if God isn't asking me to be open to the possibility of becoming a Catholic. And her eyes got wide as saucers. And she said, couldn't we be Episcopalians? <laughs> and I knew we were going into you know, uncharted waters, shall we say.